introduce you to my wife. Uh, she's, she's not here, she's at home with the kids. But I have to introduce you to the idea of my wife. <laughs> Any writer will tell you that his or her spouse or partner is, um, is crucial in the, in, the, in the process. My wife is my first reader. She's my worst, most reliable editor. She's the one I can go to when things aren't going well and she'll support me. She's the one, the, uh, when things are going well, she's, she's there to celebrate with me. I, I, she gives me ideas, she helps hone the story. I dare say my wife is my muse. But before we get all gooey on the muse thing, she's not like a muse like you would see in a Renaissance painting, you know? <laughs> the flowing gown and the little crown of laurel and all that, and she doesn't sprinkle t pixie dust on my keyboards. If you want to think of my wife as muse, you got to go a little darker than that. You know, S and M dominatrix muse. You know the whole black leather thing. Get back in your office and don't come out until you finish that chapter. That kind of muse. So, imagine that summer 2006, and I said to her, "Hey, I'm going down to Oregon for four days, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna take my laptop and I want to start a new book. It's narrated by a dog." And she said, "Would any good?" S and M dominatrix muse would say. She said, "No, no, that's not happening. Uh, you're going to finish the book you're working on, and then you're going to do the dog book." And I said, "No, please, please." So I begged and I pleaded, and finally she relented and uh, and she said, "Okay, you want to try the dog book? Go ahead, but I want to see 40 pages when you get there." That's a lot. That was a lot of pages. So I drove down to Oregon. I got to my hotel. I opened up the laptop and I said, "Doggy, you better be ready." And the first sentence came to me: "Gestures are all that I." Have. Sometimes they must be grand in nature, and I thought, I got this. So I wrote and I wrote and I wrote furiously, and four months later I had finished the first draft of The Art of Racing in the Rain. I sent it off to my agent in New York, and I waited patiently for him to call. Uh, two weeks later he called me up. It was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving in 2006. I know this specifically because we had moved to New York, to Seattle in 2001. My wife is from New York, all my relatives, my in-laws are all in New York. And this is the first Thanksgiving they were coming out to visit us in Seattle. And I do all the cooking in our house, so I was gonna do the big Thanksgiving dinner. And there was a lot of pressure on me because I had moved the whole family out to Seattle where I came from. And, and so I knew that I had to like really produce a, a really special dinner. And so I was going to Whole Foods uh, on Roosevelt Avenue in Seattle to get my Heidi organic game hen. <laughs> Nothing is too good for my mother-in-law. <laughs> and I was walking into the store and my cell phone rang and it was my agent. I thought this is perfect because he's going to tell me how brilliant I am and now it's just going to add more. My mother-in-law is going to love me even more after this phone call. So I answered the phone. I said, what do you think? And he said to me, it's narrated by a dog. <laughs> and I said, yes, I actually know that, having written it. <laughs> and he said, uh, I said, what do you think of the book? And he said, uh, no one will read a book narrated by a dog. No, I can't sell a book narrated by a dog. No publisher will buy a book narrated by a dog. No marketing department will know how to market a book narrated by a dog. It's not even narrated by a dog, he said. It's narrated by an author pretending to be a dog. To which I said, Victor Hugo wasn't a hunchback. Oh, did you get that? He's a, Victor Hugo is this French dude. Ring a bell. Hey! <laughs> anyway, he went on and on and on at great length about how this is just a disaster and this is a gimmick and no one was going to buy it and it was, I was ruining my career and worse, I was taking him down with, with me and, and he ended this whole diatribe by saying, please, please, please do me a favor, throw this book away and go write me a book I can sell. And I was kind of stunned by this whole thing and, and I guess it was maybe the holiday spirit or something, I'm not sure two words just popped into my mind, and, and I, I had to say them, not those words. <laughs> I, other words, I said, you're fired. So I fired my agent. A little advice to you guys, if any of you are writers out there. If you're working on your third novel, and let's say your first two didn't like really, I mean, they got good reviews, but they didn't sell a whole lot of copies, and let's say you're working on your third novel, and let's say it's narrated for, uh, from an alternative <laughs> point of view, like by a dog or something, <laughs> And pretend that you're going to get in a fight with your agent about that, and you're going to fire your agent on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving when your in-laws are coming into town for a really big Thanksgiving feast. It's best not to tell your spouse about that until after Thanksgiving. <laughs> Just a little thing I picked up on the road. 
<laughs> we got through the weekend okay, and then I immediately started sending up this the manuscript to other uh, agents, and they all said the exact same thing. We don't know how to sell this book. We don't know. I mean, we like the idea. It's, it's well written, we, but ha it's narrated by a dog. It's no one. We can't. No, no, we can't. And I was getting really frustrated. So I was at a fundraiser for King County Libraries in the Northwest, in the Seattle area, and uh, they do a big thing every year, uh, Literary Lions, they call it. They do a big feast with 35 authors and 35 uh, local authors, and they have 35 tables, and they, every course the writers change tables, and it's, it's a very fun event. I do it whenever I'm in town. I just did it a few months ago with that. And uh, I, so I was at this event in 2007, and I was at the pre-author dinner, and we're sitting at a table with a bunch of writers who I didn't know, and so we were introducing ourselves. And it came around to me, and I said, hi, my name is Garth, and I'm really frustrated, because I've got this book, and I think it's really good, but it's narrated by a dog, and no agent will touch it. And this other writer sitting across the table from me looked up from his plate, and he said, oh, hey, you know, you should call my agent. He sold my book, and it's narrated by a crow. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't see why he couldn't sell a book narrated by a dog. I mean, and this is a true story. Lane Mayhew, he wrote a book called Song of the Crow. <laughs> <laughs> and about a crow who stows away on Noah's Ark. And so I got his uh, information, I got the agent's information, and I sent him my pages. And um, two days later, he called me up and, uh, and he was crying. He said, I love this dog, I love this book, you have to let me represent it. And so then it went on to uh, the Art of Racing in the Rain fame. I mean, it's, it just keeps going. Enzo keeps going. Uh, you know, it's four million copies, three and a half years on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, they did a play of it. They're trying to make a movie of it. We'll see if that happens. And uh, there's a young adult version. And then these picture books, the children's picture books. Uh, one came out last year, and the new one is coming out in two weeks, the Christmas edition, Enzo and the Christmas Tree Hunt, which is, I have so much fun writing children's books. I love it. So it does prove that people will read uh, a book narrated by a dog. So I guess that's the point. The moral of the story is. <laughs> but the question is, what do you do after the art of racing in the rain. I jokingly told my publisher I had this idea about a book narrated by a cat. Uh. <laughs> I can't tell you how excited they were, which really disappointed me because that wasn't, you know, the thing is about the art of racing in the rain is that I never thought of Enzo as a dog. I thought of, I thought of it as a character. Um, he was a nearly human soul trapped in the body of a dog, and he was very frustrated by this and his inability to communicate and to interact in the ways that he wanted to do, and therefore he wanted to be done with that life so he could come back as a person. Yet he loved, he was double bound because he also loved his family so much, he didn't want to leave them. So that makes a really good, a really good character. So I'm more interested in that kind of idea, the idea of story and character than trying to, I wasn't trying to do it.